people and this track with a speaker uh, that a lot of people have uh, um, uh, appreciated the talks in the past. She has moved from different companies, but again, she's still uh, the same. Uh, it's Aliana Insana, VP product at WeTransfer. And she will talk about mapping the multi-protocol landscape and nothing better than talking about multi-protocol after uh, a track on, on uh, API <laughs> standards and protocol. Uh, can uh, Nothing better than that can happen. Hello, Aliana. How are you? I'm wonderful, Mary, and it's wonderful to be back with API Days. Thank you so much for having me. No, we're really glad to have you. And uh, yes, uh, always with great slides, so that's perfect. And <laughs> let's go for 25 minutes, 20 plus 5, about mapping the multi-protocol landscape. All right, let's take it away. So thank you, everyone. Uh, as many said, I am Aliana Inzana. I am the VP of product at WeTransfer. And welcome to Mapping the Multi-Protocol Landscape. So I've only been with WeTransfer for only, you know, about a month now. And it has been truly eye-opening for me to be back on the consumer side, um, where I'm building the APIs and I'm selecting the API tools. Um, but for many years, for those of you who don't know me, prior to being at WeTransfer, I was a product leader at an API tooling vendor. And that means I've chat with probably thousands of developers about issues that they've had with their API practice. In organizations of all shapes and sizes, we would hear the usual suspects. We don't do design first. We have problems with versioning, new deploys, they create breaking changes. But there were also some other problems and different teams would express them in various ways. But there were a few themes that I kept on hearing over and again, which I've come to think of as the multi-protocol landscape. Things like we have legacy services that are never going to get migrated to the new tech stack or we're adopting microservice architecture, which means today there's a handful of shadow services and a monolith that's still in production. Or our product team keeps saying the words real-time events. So multi-protocol implementations are already prevalent. They're not always intentional, but they're there. And the teams that are wrestling with them have shared some significant challenges uh, to work across protocols and specifications. In my mind, we are well past the point of practicing API monoculture, but it's actually really hard to talk about APIs in any other way. And that, I believe, is a function of overall maturity. Without fostering growth in multi-protocol maturity, our tech, our tooling, even our language can be a barrier to acknowledging and describing how we leverage multiple protocols to create value for our organizations. So this maturity model is theoretically at least the backbone of my talk today. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how it came about. I originally built it with my team to focus on REST maturity, and that was really lucky because REST is the most widely used architectural style, and we were able to capture some ideas about the end state for the maturity. But there's two things that I actually really like about it. First, it's both intrinsic and extrinsic. The model brought together external things that drive industry's maturity with the intrinsic needs of a company or a team that will either push, it, push maturity forward or hold it back. But the second thing I actually really liked is it wound up being sort of universal. As we moved beyond REST, we were thinking about event-driven maturity. We found the same principal forces were at work. And when we compared notes with others in the industry who were also evaluating true maturity, we found a lot of similarities. So what do I mean by extrinsic factors? I'm including things like specifications, a standard description language, something that fosters interoperability. So we're all sort of singing from the same choir sheet. And tooling to extend the capabilities of the humans in that ecosystem. And then what I would call sort of generalized organizational behaviors or practices. Now, these are things like governance that help align any organization's API program. The idea of a intrinsic need is a little bit more abstract, but I like to think of it in this way. It's the answer to the question, okay, well, why? Like, why did you document a code first API to make it easier to test? And so I wouldn't have to personally explain it to everyone who wants to use it. Why would you need governance as an organization scales to help the participants know how to change the system safely while maintaining consistency? You see, the only challenge in using this model 
in today's talk is that most organizations are still in phase one, maybe phase two, when it comes to multi-protocol maturity. Now, I want to make it clear, when I talk about broad multi-protocol maturity, I'm not exactly talking about the GitHub model. When GitHub adopted GraphQL back in September of 2016, it was their original intention that Graph was going to be the GitHub API. And then, as they have a right to, they changed their mind. And so now they support both in parallel. This is how a lot of organizations or teams begin looking at multi-protocol, where it's more like uniprotocol that has multiple parallel lanes, sort of a protocol superhighway. But for today's talk, I want to take us a step further in multi-protocol maturity and to explore the places where those seemingly parallel lines cross, where in order to deliver on behavior in a system, we must potentially traverse multiple interfaces and multiple protocols. But let's start with the basics. First off, is there any evidence that API monoculture is in fact an erroneous perspective? After all, I mean, depending on who you talk to, more than 90% of all services that we work with or build are REST. And as an industry, we've been pushing this protocol Thunderdome narrative for quite some time. You know, two specs enter, one spec leaves, REST is dead, long live GraphQL. You can see the articles there. The Thunderdome narrative makes an assumption. And it's the assumption that the path of progress is paved by revolutionary change. And what corresponds is that each new protocol, each new architecture is intended to entirely supersede what came before. So as I, I was uh, writing this talk, literally writing a talk on the multi-protocol landscape, and I'm not immune to this bias. When I decided to make a timeline of protocols and specifications for this presentation, I unconsciously went for this roadmap visual metaphor as though each step represents progress from the previous one. But that's not true. It's actually a lot closer to the truth to think about protocols and architectures as different generations sometimes, but all of which can work in the same company. That means a more accurate metaphor here would be evolutionary change. Each protocol or spec specialized independently to address a different in-market need. And in most cases, each was designed to have a slightly different, solid different problem. Now, it is very hard to know the exact number of services in production, but we can use Google Trend data as a proxy for interest. So what this chart demonstrates is that for any given point in time, active protocols are more of an array function rather than finding an inflection point where there's a changing of the guard. So what would I say to the writer of that now 12 year old stack overflow article? I think the rumors of Soap's death have been greatly exaggerated. A substantial majority of orgs are multi-protocol. Uh, when SmartBear in the 2021 State of API Quality Survey asked providers what protocols their companies use, more than 80% said they use at least two and 53% use three or more. There's also some interesting patterns when you start thinking about legacy protocols, things like SOAP. In a very unsurprising way, larger organizations are more likely to have SOAP services. 70% um, of orgs that have more than a thousand devs, for example. But it's not only legacy services that have been around for a long time that use SOAP. In fact, 30% of the companies surveyed that said they've only been developing or providing APIs for less than a year still have some SOAP protocols. And it's not just an artifact of SmartBear's data because Postman's state of API survey also confirms this use of SOAP. Now, what does this mean? I think one of your first views that many devs will have of a multi-protocol ecosystem is as they survey their own technical debt. Because when a legacy protocol service still works fine and it's independent enough that refactoring isn't required, that's going to be the result. We have a very idealized notion of how technical debt is managed, which prompts us to talk about it like we're on some sort of home makeover show. There's before and after. And we're willing to forget that whatever is before has been in production for 15 years and after is literally never going to get deployed because migrations definitionally are a journey and not a destination. And if you embrace that reality, it helps shift the monoculture mindset within an organization, which in turn will change the problems that we ask our architecture, our tools, and our strategies to solve. Now, if we aren't 
building a distributed monolith, and sometimes even if you are, then microservice architecture is another place you're likely to encounter some multi-protocol deployments. And in a weird way, there's a corollary to technical debt here because microservices are not really all or nothing architectures. In fact, according to a 2020 developer survey from O'Reilly, only 15% of adopters said that they are developing or migrating 75% or more of their systems to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, microservice oriented architecture. The business value corollary is digital transformation. But when you ask in the same survey about microservices challenges, one of the first things that everyone cites, obviously, because it's the first thing everyone cites in any of these surveys is problems with their management. So see Conway's law, um, but almost as high as organizational overhead head were issues around complexity. And microservices have two big complexity problems. The first one is decomposing a business into truly independent services. And the second is managing the resulting service landscape. And both of these issues occur at the intersection of different types of APIs. Now, I love using this diagram from Confluent of uh, microservice architecture bridged with event-driven services. I love it because I definitely think it helps you get the general idea. And if I were using it in more of like a workshop setting, I would love to ask people what's missing because literally everyone who is listening to me right now could probably come up with something the loyalty service or the recommendation service, or what about shipping? The fact is, this is a massive, gross oversimplification. And this is not a simple diagram. That has a lot of implications for multi-protocol, because if we cannot make a representation of a landscape, let alone describe its behavior, how do we manage it? To complicate the matter further, we're not just talking about our own services, meaning those that we create. 70% of developers consume and produce APIs. Another 9% consume only, which means third-party integrations, instead of being a minor concern, are a major component of the service landscape. But we don't control how those services are, or, are offered. As formats other than REST gain traction, it's much more likely that a capability you want to integrate will come in a form factor you aren't accustomed to. Now, recently I've spoken with several companies who plan to offer only GraphQL as the public face of their API business. So let's use GraphQL as an example. According to a recent Gartner survey, by 2025, more than 50% of enterprises will be using GraphQL in production. And that's up from less than 10% in 2021. And that's going to happen in the context of increased reliance on third-party APIs from roughly 10% today to 30% by 2025. So we're building microservices, we're integrating these like polyglot services. Surely we have some tools that work across these protocols. Is tools where we start our multi-protocol conversation? Okay, like it's a start. Um, but quite frankly, our tool chain has a really bad case of spec-based myopia. First off, if it's not REST, there's very spotty or thin coverage for an API developer's existing toolkit. And even fewer tools work equally well with more than one service type. This means that a developer who's working with more than one type of API will necessarily be constantly context switching between tools. This negatively impacts developer efficiency, and quite frankly, who wants to work this way? But if multi-protocol maturity follows this general model, and I would argue that it does, the first place we would expect to see some progress is in the tool chain, specifically around tools for exploration, which is a foundational activity for builders, testers, and consumers. Now, most exploratory tools take the individual blocks of a service, whether those are endpoints or channels, queries, mutations, and you either manually input them, you derive them from a service description format, and it allows users to invoke them and sometimes does nice stuff like save metadata on scope or environment. Based on the model, if multi-protocol deployments were really a thing, exploratory tooling would be one of the first places we would expect to see progress. And this is true. There are now tools out there that can do this for more than REST only. And another place where I've seen some multi-protocol progress is the tooling around checking and testing of APIs and services. Now, checks can be done with exploratory tools, but functional and behavioral tests 
often extend beyond the exercise of a single endpoint, even a single interface. Integration tests require the ability to chain together multiple sequential service calls, pass parameters from one call to the next. And that means traversing multiple interfaces potentially written in various protocols. The objective here is simulate the behavior of a system, which means multi-protocol inherently becomes a conversation about behavior. But testing can only reveal if the system acts as expected. The next place for multi-protocol tooling to evolve would be for service design. And there, we would actually call it protocol agnostic. For it to be multi-protocol when it comes out, we have to be able to design without the constraints of the semantics of a particular type of specification. Now, protocol agnostic service design has very little tooling support. There are a few things out there, though, um, that are worth sort of uh, talking about. One of them is ALPS, which is application level profile semantics. Now, ALPS has been around for some time, and sort of summarize, it documents the stuff and states of an interface. It focuses on properties, things like given name, not objects and actions, without using the particular uh, protocol specific conventions like get pets. From an ALPS document, you can then generate various standard description formats. I think this is a good start because ALPS helps separate the concerns of design and designing the system from the semantics of any particular protocol. What it doesn't yet do, though, is solve the complex problem of mapping behavior across protocols. Now, behavior-driven development is a framework that tries to solve that problem, but not for APIs, um, not specifically for APIs. When used correctly, BDD captures the true behavior of a system, the what, not the how. Uh, but as someone who's formerly worked with the staff of Cucumber, I can tell you with some authority that BDD is not always used correctly. And at the present time, even if it were, it still cannot be used to reverse engineer multiple specification formats as ALPS does. Specifications really inventory the system. Behavior captures how to create business value. And that's important because earlier tactical phases of maturity is where we focused on building infrastructure, tools, and teams to implement services. But the first and the primary test of strategic maturity is value creation. Low maturity orgs produce siloed, inaccessible value. As they mature, both through the desire to share what they've created and to manage it centrally too, they build infrastructure that's focused on collaboration and automation. The first generation of API tools simplified working with a spec. The next generation of tools will need to wrestle with behavior, working at a level of abstraction away from those individual building blocks. And there aren't many tools or vendors who will willingly take on managing complexity over creating a simplification. To be brutally honest, it's harder to explain, it's harder to sell, but as we mature our practices around APIs, and take on further optimization around value creation or making behavior or capabilities a product, then that is the challenge that it would be most impactful to solve. Now, mature API programs prioritize creating a viable ecosystem where the value is created and shared. And they do this to connect internal applications to speed new application development as we look at the multi-protocol ecosystem, this is the place where lack of tools or specifications will continue to hold back maturity. It's as though we can't have that conversation because we genuinely lack language for discussing it. But there are some things that we can do. And so I want to leave you with some ideas on how to approach multi-protocol maturity within your own organization. What are the first steps? And I think really it comes from um, taking what we've learned from building a strong REST ecosystem, and that holds the clues where to go next. Both, by the way, within our own organizations and as a broader community of practice around APIs. So number one, begin by treating all types of APIs and services as first-class citizens in your ecosystem. Lean into the places where you've already built maturity, looking at you REST, and then extend. The almost symbolic next task is commit to documentation. 
and take some steps towards design first for all APIs and services. The first documentation is essential for creating discoverable value. And the latter, design first, is really a commitment to shaping our service ecosystem through putting the customer first, even if that customer is internal. The next thing is something I will give you advice as a product manager, start somewhere. You're gonna to have to make prioritization decisions. And there I have some very general advice that I think works universally, which is make it something small enough to tackle, but large enough to learn from. API governance has in some ways a bad rep, and I never understood why. To me, the larger purpose of API governance isn't restrictive, it's instructional. It's how to allow any participant in a service ecosystem know how they can safely change things and still maintain consistency. That safety umbrella should exist beyond and extend beyond our REST services. Netflix would call this principle the context over control. And as a PM, I love the emphasis on context. This allows teams who have specific domain knowledge to do their work without creating such a broad abstraction that no one can really use it. And the final step here is truly advocate with your tooling vendors. Um, speaking of Netflix again, when Netflix created their first federated GraphQL API, uh, domain graph service, studio ecosystem, it was formerly a GraphQL monolith, and apparently it was a huge bottleneck. And what they wanted to do was use GraphQL to federate hundreds of microservices to present a unified presentation layer. But Apollo, who was their GraphQL tooling vendor, didn't really do that. Um, but when Netflix asked, they started to work together to create the GraphQL federated, uh, sorry, GraphQL federation spe specification, and they did that in 2019. As my best friend's dad always used to say, you don't ask, you don't get. So please make a point of presenting your use cases and working in partnership with your vendors to solve real problems that we have. John Houston Finley defines maturity as the capacity to endure uncertainty. If the events of the past few years have shown us anything, they've proven that organizational resilience is tested more by an uncertain future than by failed products, mismarkets, even scandals. Evolutionarily speaking, enduring uncertainty requires participants in an ecosystem to respond flexibly to changing conditions and to recognize when different tools or tactics are required. If we approach multi-protocol in this way, we diversify our expertise internally and evolutionary change can actually be quick. Biologically, it's possible within a single generation. Adopting a multi-protocol view at the outset allows organizations to optimize delivery, leaning into what these individual protocols and specifications do best to improve the resilience of a solution that we provide for our customers. That optimization begins when we go from focusing exclusively on an individual specification and we start emphasizing using the right mix of technologies to deliver on a capability or behavior. In other words, it's where we build what we need and not just what we know. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Aliana. Uh, we, have, uh, we have time for, uh, uh, I think we have one minute. Uh, uh, we, we, can, we can ask questions. So, uh, how long it will go? How many protocols can we support? You know, how many layers? You, you know, know, I really think the question is not going to be limited by, you know, the invention of a new protocol. It's more about when a protocol comes out and is it does something in a more useful way. Like I think of this when I think of, of the async API specification. There were event-driven specifications before. They were mostly focused on the event payload. The innovation of async API was really to begin to discuss the brokers, the endpoints, the, the things that um, were the infrastructure of the system that made it more um, actionable for a lot of people. So I think we really will see evolution where it needs to happen. And if you look at the sort of earlier slide of the roadmap, there haven't been that many protocols that have been successful. There was kind of like a whole bunch of different specification formats for REST, but 
realistically now, open API specification is the dominant one. Um, I think we do see a certain amount of survival of the fittest here, but I don't think we will ever see the end of the evolution because the end of the evolution would come at the end of where we currently are finding our stuff. And I think Web3, we're going to see some new things that connect into that ecosystem. Um, when I think about VR and those those types of processing, eventually they they will also hold some evolution to our current uh, service architecture. So I think multi-protocol is also embracing the resilience to move ourselves forward. And if we don't do it, we're constantly going to be working with a fractioned tool chain. And really, like, who wants to work like that? I totally uh, agree. And, and it reminds me, you know, a debate I had on energy, you know, energy solutions. So we had coal and gas and oil and nuclear and renewables, and they all add to each other. We never re remove one when they are useful. Once we found they are useful, mm -hmm. we never remove one. We never diminish their really consumption. We just add new layers of new consumption for new use cases and new technologies, right? It seems it's the same here. Yeah, well, I, I worked in the energy industry. I can definitely tell you it's the same. Um, it, you, you've captured it exactly. Um, and part of it is just because of consumption. I mean, think about um, the Google survey where they sort of said that there was however many billion API calls. And then the year after the pandemic started, it was increased by 50%. That's huge, huge growth. When you think about things that are growing like this, there has to be more that supports it. And people will inevitably find new things to do with it. So I never look at the question of evolution as having an endpoint. Evolutionary endpoint is like extinction level event. And I just don't see that happening for the web, for um, using electronic protocols and interfaces to communicate with each other. And, you know, we continue to evolve. Yeah, no, so uh, it, it's re um, it really reminds me of the Jevons paradox. Are you familiar with the Jevons paradox? Also called the rebound effect. When okay. you earn, yeah, when you earn, let's say, optimization on something, you use these new resources to invest on, uh, you know, new ones, right? Yeah. So it seems when we master soap and new technology comes, we focus. Oh, we have now time and energy to invest in new type of rest, and then when rest like doesn't have any more, uh, let's say, earnings mm -hmm. on uh, differentiation makers, GraphQL comes for new use cases, and now we invest in this. So it seems it's always what we have, right? Yeah. And it means managing a lot of complexity and learning a lot of stuff. But I also see a role for spe specialization. Like, I wouldn't use GraphQL for everything. It's cool. It does a lot of great things, especially if you have problems with overfetching. But it's not, it's not, it's not perfect for everything. And so allowing these things to serve out their specialization, serve out their purpose, I actually think is a much more sustainable way of functioning as a company and as an API organization and as an API community, really. Um, so there's always going to be room for more, but adapting to the fact that multi-protocol is kind of a thing, I think will actually help us continue in that stream of resilience. And we, an energy I'm not anymore, I don't have to worry about actually building it, um, but I'll be after all my vendors to have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No. So we have an energy mix. We have a protocol mix and a stack mix, and you know they add to each other, and uh, that's a uh, story. True. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aliana. We were glad to we were glad to have you uh, and to end this track on protocols with actually matching maturity with protocols and and being <laughs> able to handle them all for their use cases. They are not good. There is not one that fits all, all always one for a use case and more use case, more protocols. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so Ali. much, Betty. Take care. Bye-bye.